Welcome to Picks with the Professor, the show where a real statistics professor and his friends give you sports betting tips. I am your host, Professor Sides, and this college football episode covers bowl games scheduled to be played from December 27th through December 31st here in the 2022 bowl season. In case you're new here, check out the webpage on the banner. It's www.pickswiththeprofessor.com slash new for some explanations, goals, and community rules. As always, remember, there are no locks in gambling, and so what Cousin Jared and myself will try to do is make at least one successful pick on every game, all at at one unit each. There are also picks even out on the websites of Patreon's Plays of the Day. But I also recommend an extra half unit. The compilation of those recommended results can be found on both BetStamp and in the Google Sheet. Links in the show description. The Google Sheet also contains a full set of projections. And for early access to those, hit a Patreon. The link is in the crawler below. That's also where you can access the Discord chat, which is the best place to get your questions answered about these or other games. But as always, take what you like and leave the rest. Lastly, please understand that good and bad variants will occur. So as much as we'd like to say will be profitable each and every day, that is an impossible reality for any gambler. Because, uh, Jared, bowl season has been really good to us so far. It has been good to us so far, and I can't believe that we're already getting to you know the Sugar Bowl, the the Orange Bowl coming up here before the end of the year. I feel like this is kind of what college football you're kind of going for all season are these these big bowl games. It's kind of the prize at the end of the season, and and somehow here we are. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, last set of bowls, five, two, and one with the Quick Lane Bowl happening about to start pretty soon from when we're recording uh, this right now. So by the time you're watching this, you might have a better idea of how that game has gone for us. But things have been going really well for us. Uh, so far, the strategy has been mostly just take underdogs and say, yep. why are you giving me points when it's these two teams that are pretty close to equal? Who the heck knows what's going to happen? Maybe sprinkle a little bit on the money line. And that's been a very winning strategy. We're going to do the same uh, for a handful of games today, but... Not quite as heavy as we were before. Uh, we were talking about yeah. this a little bit before show that uh, earlier on in these games, a lot of these teams are really bad. And you can get more than a field goal, just grab it. Who really knows, right? Yeah. And as we get towards these later bolts, there's a handful of them that you look at and say, these two teams aren't equal. And there's some real reasons why you should actually take a favorite. So I think this one will be a little more interesting episode of you know dodging back and forth between grabbing points with a who the heck knows, so that's too many points, and then laying it with a favorite and saying, hey, here's why this one might be a runaway game because it's not quite like some of the other bowl games that we talked about. Yep. De- definitely agree. There are some spots here and even there are some spots where teams that I don't like, but even I will implore you to lay the points with them because the numbers just don't add up from what we're seeing. Yeah. I feel like there's a handful of those. Uh, it might be a, a tough episode for you, for you to get, your, get to make your way through with some of the yeah, teams well, that we've decided to back for, yeah. for better or worse. Uh, but before we get to these bulk games, some reminders, please hit that like button if you're on YouTube. Also, if you aren't yet, please consider subscribing or following. It's free. And if you turn on notifications, you don't miss any of the college basketball and MLBR college football content that this channel provides. I already mentioned the Patreon, but check it out if you haven't yet. Lots of great benefits to be found over there above and beyond what we do here. Membership starts at just $3 per month. Get you the plays of the day. You can also join our Discord chat, which is a lot of fun, a lot of good information being uh, disseminated there over the sports we cover here and other sports. Uh, again, lots of good things over there. www.patreon.com slash picks with the professor. But even if you're not there, we're still thrilled to have you here. Let's get to the games. All lines except for two, <laughs> courtesy of Bet Online. The other two we're going to grab from BetUS. Both those sign-up links are in the show description. We always just do everything courtesy of Bet Online. There's a couple of exceptions. There's two games we'll talk about when we get there that Bet Online is like the only place that has a certain number, but it's widely available everywhere else. And again, at BetUS, which is another uh, link you can use in the description to sign up for. Um, and we're going to take a slightly different number on those two uh, different games. But otherwise, um, most lines courtesy of Bet Online, all, all current as the time of this recording here, we've all locked them into Bet Stamp around noon central on Monday, the 26th. We're going to kick us off Tuesday. We've got four games here on Tuesday, the 27th. We're going to start off with a game. Uh, Georgia Southern will play Buffalo. Maybe a l- less exciting of a matchup. This one's going to be the Camellia Bowl in Montgomery, Alabama. Um, Buffalo kind of backing their way into a bowl game, to be honest. That's I mean, they it nicely. Three- yeah, they had three chances to get bowl eligible and needed kind of a miracle in the last game against Akron of all teams just to do it. Blew some late leads. Uh, very disappointing team. Georgia Southern just kind of ho-hum for the most part on the season after that big win against Nebraska. Of course, as we saw later, that didn't really... Uh, yeah. It, it, was, it was a big name in, win, in, in, a big win in name alone more yes. than anything yes. else. 
Um, both of these teams are six and six. Sideline says that Georgia Southern was the 89th best team, or projects to be the 89th best team going forward. Buffalo, the 101st best team. Um, and not really a lot to report with regards to players out. The running backs, both for Buffalo, did not play in the regular season finale. I guess Akron, they uh, are going to miss a couple of other players through the transfer portal. Not a lot really to be that concerned about. Um, getting those running backs back would be huge, but. Uh, we're going to take the four points with Buffalo. And I kind of feel like the short answer is who the heck knows grab points. That's what we've been saying for most of these games. And this, I know it's, we're getting later into the bowl season, but this game feels like it should have happened on December 22nd. Oh yeah, and, definitely. And, yeah. Maybe Jude, like December 16th. <laughs> there you go. Cause Jared, what are other reasons why uh, we're, we're good with grabbing the points here? This one. Because uh, I've been wrong on Buffalo all season, and after what I have seen from them the past three games, I would say there is no way. I'm pretty sure that's the first thing we did when we came on to talk about these is I don't want to back Buffalo. Uh, but then we talked about it's it's just too many points with two not great teams in a game. Who knows what's going to happen? And as I, I started to say, I've been wrong on Buffalo all season. This is definitely a spot where I'd say fade Buffalo, and so surely that means Buffalo is going to win this game outright if I were going to fade them. So, yeah, let's grab the four points. It's been a good strategy for us so far uh, this bowl season, and uh, I think there's no reason why you shouldn't take the four points here as well. Yep, although switching up from that strategy, we're going to move on to the afternoon game here, 315 Eastern Utah State Memphis. We're going to lay the seven with Memphis. Sideline says this should be, and I had to double check the math if this was right. It says it should be <laughs> Memphis minus 18. And I was like, yeah, yeah. What are we doing here? Like, uh, yeah. you know, Memphis, they're both six and six teams. This feels like the opposite of the Hawaii Bowl. And we got a winner with Middle Tennessee State and in the, the most gloriously terrible game I yeah. can remember watching in a long time. I yeah. mean, that game was just garbage. Well, and playing it at that temporary stadium that uh, Hawaii is at where, like, the camera <laughs> angle is so low, like, just adds another level of garbage to the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that game was one where it's like, wait a minute, why is San Diego State favored by seven? Like, yeah, they might be the better team, but like not by that much. Right. And this is the, the bizarro version of that game where it's like, why is Memphis not favored by more in this? Uh, again, obviously, it's a huge mathematical edge according to the model, both teams six and six. But I've got Utah State ranked 109th, whereas Memphis I've got ranked 51st. So it's it's two very not equal six and six teams. Utah State's leading rusher um, will enter the draft, but will play. So both of these teams, these teams are mostly at full strength. I don't understand why Memphis is only a seven-point favorite. Uh, Cousin Jared, what are the other reasons why we're going to lay seven with Memphis? Uh, just Utah State's bad. Okay, and so this was the person that took the Utah State over seven wins, uh, season-long win total. I knew after that first game against UConn, they, they were not going to be getting above seven wins this season. You look at who they've played. I mean, they, they barely beat San Jose State. They beat Hawaii. They beat New Mexico. Uh, they beat Colorado State. Um, Memphis is on another planet compared to some of these teams that Utah State has, has beaten this year. Utah State, maybe more than any other team, has benefited from how down the Mountain West was this season because in any other year in the Mountain West, in any other conference, aside from maybe, you know, like, I don't know, the MAC or, or, or maybe something like that, this Utah State team does not get to six wins. So I think this Utah State team is just very bad. They, they kind of benefited from being in a bad conference this season. And as much as I dislike the Memphis Tigers, the bane of my existence, they are a much better team than Utah State. And I am shocked that this number is below like 10. You know, you could convince yeah. me set it at 10, um, even though that would be way off from what sideline says. It's a bowl game. Who knows? 10 points is, is so many. Maybe set it at 10 there and I'd say, okay. Uh, but seven is just <laughs> not enough points. Yeah, I, and I think you nailed it there. Um, this opened around eight, and the model would have said lay the eight, no big deal. But I'm with you. Once it gets above a touchdown, you do you do hesitate a little bit. You tap the brakes yeah, a little yeah. bit. It worked for Oregon State um, in a game that we said as long as it was between seven and ten. And that's kind of I would have come back to the same thing. Above ten, I would have said the model probably likes it, but gosh, it's a bowl game. But like, hey, seven to ten is still a great investment. And then it dropped to seven, and it's like I don't quite understand why right. anything can happen in sports. But there's just nothing that I see with regards to seeing who's going to play this game. That in the, and how these two teams have played all season that indicates that Memphis isn't yep. the side here. You do talk about Memphis being the bane of your existence. We were four and three backing Memphis this season and three and one fading them. So, yeah, that's not bad. No, I, no, I, no, I, no. I, 
Memphis, the Memphis totals have been maybe the band of your existence a little bit more too. And yeah, that's true. There's a reason why we're not we're not touching the total on this one, uh, which has come down from 63 to 60 and a half, but not at a play that we are going to invest in. Uh, Tuesday night, 6.45 Eastern, East Carolina and Coastal Carolina. Uh, this one's a fun one because the two teams in Carolina should probably be playing in like Greensboro or Charlotte or, or, or something like that. And yeah. Instead, they're playing down in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, Coastal, I mean, wow. Uh, yeah. Losing the, losing the coach. They are losing their starting center. McCall has entered the transfer portal, but he is going to play – um, I think how you view this game a lot depends on how you view Coastal's last few games. And and my take and the model's take is that McCall clearly wasn't 100% in that game. Um, and they looked very terrible without him. And one of those games you can write off because of motivation. But to some extent, that, that matters. That data matters. And they looked really bad. Yeah. And, and I don't think he can solve all their problems. And, and if he was in that call for championship game at 80%, making him 100% now... Mm-hmm. I don't see what that's going to do. He's obviously a very good quarterback. Um, if, if he wants to come to Baylor, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be sad if, if he wants. To do that. <laughs> you know, I think he's a great quarterback, but I yeah. think the rest of the team just isn't very good. Uh, we're going to lay the seven with East Carolina. Um, there's a couple of minor players for each team that are out beyond that, but but nothing overly major. Uh, Sideline says this should be East Carolina at minus thirteen, and it's really taking a hard stance against the way Coastal Carolina played at the end and saying, "I know that McColl." wasn't in for all of that, but this team has some real problems. Who knows about the coaching distractions? Uh, yeah. Cause Jared, what are the other reasons why we're laying the seven with East Carolina? So I, I think obviously McCall being out is, is a huge hit there. Uh, but uh, Oh my gosh, blanking on his name, coach for coastal Carolina, Chadwell, Jamie Chadwell. Chadwell. Like it was, it was well known. Like some coaches are like CEOs of their programs. Chadwell was like an offensive guy. He, he, that offense was really his and he's kind of what made it unique. So uh, losing McCall and losing Chadwell, both on that offense from again, from what made coastal so unique, I think it's just a gut punch that they won't be able to get past. And I think you got to look over at the ECU side and Holton Ehlers, Holton Ehlers has over a hundred career touchdowns. This is like approximately his 15th year starting at quarterback for ECU. I think he's going to go out with, a bang in, in this one. I think the ECU is going to be able to put up a lot of points, not because Coastal's defense is necessarily terrible. I mean, they're not good, but it's just their offense isn't getting enough yards. That defense, Coastal's defense is having to stay on the field for, for such a long time. I just don't see that being a recipe for success in, in, for Coastal in this game. I don't think they're going to be able to score enough points. I think ECU is going to put up quite a bit capitalizing on that tired uh, Coastal defense. So I don't see this one being close. I think that what Coastal has lost is just kind of difficult to measure. Even sidelines saying that it should be two touchdowns. I just think it's really tough to account for the loss of McCall and Chadwell. Yeah, and uh, this is one of those uh, games we talked about at the start of the show that's seven and a half at Bet Online, but Bet US has it at seven. It's widely available at seven. I'm still right now. And so that's all obviously the better number to get. So shopper, I make sure you only lay seven just because that push protection is such a key number in college football makes a lot of sense. Uh, Coast Carolina is nine and three, but Silent race them a hundred and third. And again, yeah. it just, it really is not buying into this nine and three records is that a lot of those wins were against softer opponents and just the way yeah. they look these last few games when they played a real team in Troy, just getting smoked there and a real team in James Madison, even without McCall yeah. getting smoked in those two games that East Carolina is a pretty solid team, you know, around middle of the pack in college football, uh, yeah. a seven and five team in a decent conference, you know, they're not great, but they're not bad. And, uh, that, that's going to be way too much for Coastal to handle. Yep, definitely agree. And what would Coastal's rating be if, you know, if, if you take in, only consider what they've done with, without McCall and things, since things kind of gone off the rails, I think I think oh, it's probably yeah. more than 103. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and even with McCall, I, I'd have to go back and look, but I mean, they weren't really much higher than like 80th, even with McCall 100%. The model just wasn't buying into it, just kind of saying it's been a weak schedule. And, you know, they mostly have lost to better teams and they beat up on bad teams. It's a bad conference, uh, yep. red division that they were able to play in. And so they, they beat up on a lot of the weaker teams in their division. And, yep. um, you know, that, that got them a lot of wins, but that doesn't make them a great team. And so we're like the seven there with East Carolina, which takes us to Tuesday night. Um, we've got two plays on this game. And, you know, you can make a hard case that you should have zero on them just because of how gross this game is. I feel like I'm going to talk for 10 minutes just talking about who's not playing in this game. Uh, this one's out in the desert. Uh, this is the guaranteed rate bowl at Chase Field in Phoenix. This is one where they play in a baseball stadium. I mean, let's just start off right there. Gross number one playing at the baseball yep. stadium just always makes it weird. And I, I just yep. don't understand. I don't understand why. Uh, whatever. Wisconsin, <laughs> Graham Mertz out, which 
hurts a little, I guess. Does I don't it? really know. Does it? I don't know. I I'm don't not know. convinced. I'm not convinced. <laughs> I'm not sure why Florida, like what did Florida see that made them want to take a chance on Graham Mertz? I know it was highly rated prospect. I mean, this is outside the scope of this show, uh, but just confusing by that one. That's right up there with Justin Wilcox turning down Oregon to stay at Cal. I never forget. Um, yeah. I, I feel like we can have a whole show on questionable transfer decisions like yeah. JT Daniels to Rice. I, yeah. Huh? Like, yeah. it's just a lot that's just like, we could just dive into and be like, there's a lot of reasons, I'm sure, but it's just very interesting. That, that's obviously what was. So, so no Mertz here for Wisconsin. They're also going to be without their starting center, starting defensive lineman, a starting cornerback, um, uh, a linebacker that's declared for the NFL draft. That I don't even know if he's going to play or not. The coach, uh, you know, new coach, obviously. But Oklahoma State is not much better. Spencer Sanders, who was I, losing Spencer Sanders, I'm not sure if that helps or hurts. Like 100% Spencer Sanders is a good quarterback. I'm not sure the last time we saw him 100%. He tried to play for the yeah. whole back half of the season in and out and was clearly not 100%. Yeah. Really struggle with injuries. He's not playing. Uh, Gutter Gundy, who I assume is uh, the coach's son, is one of the two options yeah. for quarterback. Neither one of them has looked great. They've also lost a starting linebacker who had almost 100 tackles, a 500-yard rushing running back, um, a couple other guys to transfer. I mean, both these two teams were already, I feel like, kind of limping coming into this and not yep. really great, and then losing all, like, half their key players. I understand it, I guess, from a for these players. You're not really motivated to play in this bowl game. It's late at night. Um, it, it's going to be probably pretty ugly with regards to what you expect from these two teams. That I think what's left of these two teams is probably still better than Georgia Southern and Buffalo. But the difference is, is you just expect so much more and they right. aren't going to really have it on the field. Um, in my opinion, sideline makes this Wisconsin minus two and a half. Wisconsin went six and six this year. Not a great record, but still ranks them 32nd overall because obviously it was a tough schedule. Um, Oklahoma State went seven and five and is ranked 44th. The way I kind of view this is sideline says this should be three and I have no idea how to really penalize both teams for what they lost, but I yeah. think it's a lot on both sides. And so I'm going to say it's probably a wash. It reminds me of what we talked about the week before. Who the heck knows? This game could get really ugly. Grab three and a half points. It makes sense because it's not like either team really has anything I think you can point to yep. to really make you like them. If you want to talk about Wisconsin's defense, you can also counter that with the fact that the experience that Gundy has as a coach historically has helped teams do a little bit better in bowl games. And so there's kind of a counter angle to everything you want to talk about. So just grab three and a half points. Yep. And kind of similar to that, we're going to grab the under 44 and a half because I don't know what's going to happen. 44 is the most key number in sports. So when you see a 44 and a half, what do you do? You go under. Because <laughs> yeah. Jared, what, what is your take on this one? Yeah, so I think we what we're trying to do here is we're trying to apply lessons we learned with the Eastern Michigan bowl game, and I can't yeah. remember who Eastern Michigan played right now. Uh, but we took the under in that game. Uh, we should have taken the, San Jose State. We took the under in that game. We should have taken the points with Eastern Michigan. So here, really, what we're trying to do is I think we're just trying to lower our risk a little bit by taking two plays, taking the three and a half points, going to under forty four and a half. I think worst case, one of these uh, wins, and, and you know, if the other loses, okay, we've kind of minimized our risk there. But I think there's decent shot. They both of them win. So uh, this game, I think, is going to be ugly. When you got an ugly game, let's take the under and grab over a uh, over a, a field goal when you can. Yeah, we always talk about like you're not just playing. You're not playing teams. You're playing numbers, right? I always yeah. like you probably heard me say, if you were you're playing numbers and teams. It both matter. In this yeah. case, we're kind of just playing the numbers, and we're not even caring. We're just these two teams are just shells of themselves at this yeah. point, and we are kind of just playing the number and just saying. Three and a half, 44 and a half. These are some really, we are on the right side of two really key numbers. We're just going to play the odds and say that that's going to help us out in one way, shape, or form in a game that, again, who really knows? Uh, the late night game. It, if, if you don't stay up and watch this, you know, it's probably good for your mental health. Um, <laughs> unless you're, you know, you're a fan or alumni of one of these two schools. Um, yeah. Who knows what you're going to wake up to in the morning. So it's just one of those. We're just trying to make smart plays here by grabbing uh, the, the hook with the field goal and grabbing the hook on the most key number uh, or yep. one of the most key numbers in totals of 44. Yep. Which takes us to Wednesday, the afternoon game here, 2 p.m. Eastern, UCF and Duke. Duke is a three-point favorite at bet online. With minus 124 odds, they're only three. A handful of threes out there. They mostly moved to three and a half elsewhere. Um, so again, as, assuming you're watching this before that number's moved, the sign up lead for Bet Online is in the description to get that number. It's only there 
um, and, and a couple other random places. Um, even if you're a domestic only player, I do always recommend having a couple offshores. They have some advantages that they can offer um, with regards to offering reduced juice on a lot of games. So it's never bad to have one of those as your outlets. Um, and so again, that sign up link in the show description there, you can lay three with Duke. It's got a little bit of odds, but it's worth it. I would never recommend buying to three because you're probably paying more than it's worth because they, they know what the probability is and they know what they're charging and they're charging you more than you're getting. So it's more about shopping around and finding a place that has a better price on the three because at three and a half, you're probably going to have to be laying more. When you buy down, you're probably going to be laying more like minus 130, minus 135. And that's yeah. a really high price, but minus 124 makes sense to lay it with Duke here. Uh, the model says it should be UCF minus 1.4, um, likes UCF overall as the better team than Duke. They did get one extra win than Duke, nine and four versus eight and four. But when you consider what UCF is dealing with, quarterback John Reese Plumley, I assume he'll be more healthy, but I don't really know if he's going to be 100%. Their number one receiver um, is out, uh, transfer the top linebacker is out, one of their better defensive backs also transferring they've lost their defensive coordinator uh there's just a lot happening there with ucf yeah. and so the model says ucf should be favored but when you consider everything that's going on with ucf i, I don't think that's the way we would view it so in some of these again we kind of just think what the model says and we kind of trust it it seems about right other times we have to look at it and say we have to make some sort of adjustment because all these guys that are leaving there's some key guys for ucf duke's been great to us so we're gonna lay the three with them because jared what's your take my take is, is that we should honor Duke by being so good to us all season and lay the three and a half points. Uh, I just agree with everything you said. I think there's a lot of questions about UCF and, and Duke has just been rock solid for us all, all year long. Uh, first time getting to a bowl game in a couple of years for Duke. I think they're going to come out ready to play. Um, UCF ha had the chance to, to get to the, the uh, excuse me, Cotton Bowl, I guess, and, and lost that game to Tulane. So maybe a little bit of a letdown spot for them having to go for potentially playing a big school in the Cotton Bowl to playing this game against Duke. So uh, I, I want to lay the three points with Duke. Again, if anything else, this can just be a, a thank you, Duke, for everything you've done for us this season. Yeah, they've been really good uh, against the spread all season um, to the tune of a 9-2 and two record. We backed them on about half of those, and it mostly worked. But every time we faded Duke, it, it turned against us. So it's one of those, yeah. let's yeah. not make that same mistake. Uh, yeah. This seems to be played in Annapolis. And so if there is any bit of fan advantage you have to assume it goes to duke ucf's been in a lot of bowl games you have to assume they're not really excited to go up to a game in maryland in yeah. colder weather here in late december but duke fans not a large fan base but what fans they do have um a lot of them would be a little bit more excited probably to travel to this game so yeah. i'm not sure duke gets much of an edge there but if there is any to be found it's probably a little bit of a motivational a little bit of a fan edge or whatever the proximity for duke a little bit more there than ucf so you can lay the three there even with a little bit of odds is too good to pass up the early evening game wednesday 5 30 p.m eastern kansas and arkansas uh i mean kansas has been a fantastic story all season kind of fell apart towards the end of the season, mainly because they just could not stop the run. And yeah. uh, cousin Jared, what does Arkansas do again? They run the ball pretty well from what I oh, recall. Yeah, they run the ball pretty well. Uh, we're going to go over in this one with regards to who's around and not around. Uh, Jalen Daniels should be back for Kansas. Uh, they look just as good, really, with Bean. I'm not really sure there's a huge yeah. difference between those two guys um, yeah. either way. So the Kansas offense will be good. Their defense, though, should be fully there. But the problem is, of course, it's not a great defense. They will have lots of time to prepare, which will help, but I just don't think it's going to matter, really. Yeah. Um, given what I saw as a Big 12 fan watching a lot of Kansas football this year, Arkansas got some guys out on both sides of the ball. Um, they are losing all uh, first team all SEC linebacker and a first team all SEC pool. center. All, all, all SEC, uh, first team all SEC name team as well in Bumper Pool. Yeah. Yes, he's out for injury. Uh, they've lost a couple. They lost a defensive back here, a tight end, a, a receiver to the portal. Uh, their leading receivers entering the NFL draft. Uh, a, a defensive lineman who started every single game has entered the portal. Uh, Arkansas's not really the full team at this point, whereas Kansas yeah. mostly is. I think the biggest question on this game is what sort of motivation level does Arkansas have? And, and I can't answer that question. I don't really know. But I think how you assess that determines how you feel about this game. A sideline says Arkansas minus 6.4, that obviously all six and sixes are not rated equal, and that Arkansas at six and six is still a much better team than Kansas at six and six. And based yeah. off what we saw with our eyeballs, I think that makes a lot of sense. The problem is, is this is not a full Arkansas team. So you have to give some discount to that. 
from 6.4 down. It's hard to say exactly what, but the number right now, it's two and a half, seems about right. Um, yeah. Honestly, on the, if I was going to play Arkansas, I'd lay the two and a half. I was going to play Keynes. I'd just take the money line and just say, I don't really know what's going to happen on this, but take the plus odds there. It's just not yeah. big enough plus odds for me to get excited about in a game that we think is going to have a lot of points. And if Arkansas comes out motivated and decides to run the ball like they can, like we've seen them most of the season, they're going to run all day long Kansas, and it's going to be really yeah. hard to stop them. If they come out not motivated, Kansas could win this game. So I can yeah. really see it going either way. The one thing I'm pretty certain of is I think there's going to be a lot of points. We're going to go over 69. If Kansas wins, it's going to be because they score a lot because Arkansas's defense just doesn't show up. And I just I can't see really a world where Arkansas isn't able to just run all over Kansas unless their offense just decides to take the day off. Um, Kissing Jared, what's your take? Yeah, you laid it all out there really well. Just lather, rinse, repeat from everything you've seen from Kansas games so far this season. They just cannot stop anybody from running the ball. And I think Arkansas is just going to go up and down the field. So you mentioned you wouldn't be surprised if Kansas won this game. I wouldn't either, but you know, don't feel great about it. So the only thing I can feel like I can say for sure is going to happen is there's going to be a lot of points. So let's just hope for an exciting game that gets high scoring. And again, I have a lot of faith in both teams to not be able to stop each other. Absolutely. This game will be in Memphis. And so I, I assume it's going to be a sellout. The Liberty Bowl has to be thrilled about this matchup. Arkansas being close. Yeah. Yeah. Arkansas fans are pretty passionate fan base. I assume they're going to sell out their allotment of tickets. Yeah. Uh, Kansas not having been in a bowl game in a while. I assume they're going to be really excited for this. It's not that far. It's, it's a little further from Lawrence, Kansas to, to Memphis, but it's not too far. Um, yeah. It should be a, a packed stadium and a fantastic atmosphere. A game that I'm really excited to watch. If it plays out like we think at a lot of points, it should be a fun one as well. Um, again, not really sure who wins. Wins at two and a half, you know, it, it, I, I for sure wouldn't lay more than three with Arkansas. They're missing too many guys at this point um, to make me want to lay more than a field goal. But at two and a half, if you if you think that you know Arkansas shows up and is motivated, if you think Arkansas wants to be here, I think laying that two and a half makes a lot of sense. If you think they're if you're concerned about that, maybe take a chance on the Kansas money line. It's kind of how I would recommend yep. that. But we're going to pass on both of those because we just aren't sure. And so instead, yep. we're going to play the over sixty nine instead. Uh, Wednesday, there's two later games, 8 p.m. Eastern, North Carolina versus Oregon, uh, in a game with a total of 75 out in the <laughs> Holiday Bowl in San Diego. Um, Holiday Bowl being played in Petco Park because I don't know. Uh, I mean, didn't, didn't, yeah, didn't San Diego State just build like a brand new stadium it's beautiful. out there? Yeah, it's yeah, beautiful. So, I'm, so I'm very, I'm very confused. I'm very confused, um, but whatever. That's what's happening. Um, Oregon's defense already was questionable. Losing a star linebacker to prepare for the NFL draft, losing first-team All-Pac-12 cornerback, um, also having a linebacker that's transferred. North Carolina's defense already questionable. Um, they're also losing uh, three starters on defense, including first all another first all-namer in Storm Duck. Um, who was a starting cornerback. The defenses in this game are just, we're already bad and going to get worse. The tempo should be fast. Um, with regards to the spread, we're going to grab the 14. A sideline says it should be only uh, 10. Uh, or should be something that says it should be, uh, it should be about 14. Uh, I think the issue with this one is, in a bowl game with this many points, not really knowing what's going to happen, you've got a, a coach with a lot of experience yeah. With North Carolina, with Mac Brown, uh, versus one without that sort of experience at Oregon, that could play a factor. I, just in general, it's hard to lay a number like 14 in a bowl game. Um, there were some 14 and a half around that hook might matter. It might not. Um, I just expect fireworks in this one, and yeah. I, I don't. I don't think North Carolina can stop Oregon. I'm not sure how much North Carolina gets stopped really either. And so at that point, 14 points seems like a pretty solid investment. So we're gonna grab the points yeah. and go over because Jared, what is your take? Yeah, I feel like the the over here is kind of self explanatory. If you watch either, you know, both of these teams this season, that that one's pretty easy. You you sent something to me right at the beginning of bowl season where it said uh, it was something to the effect of uh, coaches that are coaching more than ten bowl games against coaches coaching their first bowl game were like. 80% against the spread yeah. or something like that. And so I think you've got a situation here with Mac Brown, uh, knowing exactly what to do to kind of bide his time with long layoffs like this, uh, go, going against, uh, uh, Dan Lanning for, for Oregon, which again, could have been Justin Wilcox, but he chose not to go there. Uh, I, I just think that North Carolina is going to have a little something for, for Oregon in this game. I think Oregon is a better team. I think Oregon wins, especially oh, yeah. with how North Carolina uh, played uh, down the stretch, just not looking that great. But with so much time to prepare, I think Mac can can dive into his bags of tricks from all, all of his years there and 
come up with something to keep this game uh, closer than 14. Uh, we talked about taking the dogs have been a, a, you know, a profitable thing to do this bowl season. 14 points is a lot of points in a, in a bowl game, even for two high scoring teams, 14 points is a lot of points. Yeah. And I think you hit the nail on the head talking there about Mac Brown with a bag of tricks as, as a, as a thought, many, many of you know, my father is a, a Texas alumni. So I, I hear a lot about UT and watched a lot of them growing up and watching those Mac Brown coach Longhorn teams growing up, they tended to uh, underperform a little bit in bowl games when they were big favorites. And they tended to play really well when they weren't big favorites. And it's that experience of having that little something in their bag of tricks to motivate you, whatever it is, yeah. pointing to the spread, whatever it may be. He seemed to do a pretty good job um, when, you know, they weren't getting a lot of respect coming through and people were kind of writing them off. That's when he had, teams that did well in bowl games um you know people that, people talk about they had a couple of disappointing seasons i'm like a couple of the chris sims seasons were disappointing you know uh, what the expectations were and that's all you heard all into the bowl game and they they played yeah. really well in the bowl and then and that was part of the problem i think was that they played well in the bowl and the next season was like well now yeah. we're gonna do really well yeah, and and, yeah. and they, you know, then they would kind of be mediocre again and then having that bowl prep and so like he kind of knew how to motivate them and, and sometimes they struggled when they were supposed to destroy a team and they just couldn't get that focus and, and i think that was probably less about mac and more about we always talk about it, the type of player who goes to the University of Texas, Southern Cal, Ohio State, Michigan, right? These guys who are going to these top-notch programs, they are the best of the best. And it might be a little bit harder to motivate them always for a weaker opponent, right? And so a lot yeah. of times I think that kind of caught up to him at Texas in some of the, those situations where they weren't expected to be – or they were expected to do a lot better. But when they were – had been – you know, punch in the mouth a little bit. He always seemed yeah. to have them ready to go. And so yeah. that same sort of thing, I, I feel like carries over. It seems like the players love him. And so um, yeah. I think that also speaks a lot for bowl season when you have players who like a coach. It helps you get through the practices for this bowl season. Helps you, you know, work on your trick plays, work on your your new schemes, your new things that you're trying to figure out how to how to handle this Oregon offense. Again, like you said, Oregon's a better team. Oregon should win this game. Um, yeah. 14 is just a lot of points, especially yeah. when you look at both teams. Both teams are missing a lot. Um, at this point with regards to uh, transfer and draft, that sort of situation. So I think more on the defensive side. So we're going to go over on points, grab the yeah. points um, both for that one. Yep. Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern, the Houston Bowl, uh, Ole Miss at Texas Tech. This one, of course, will be in a dome, so we won't have to worry about – um, weather on this was me the, the Texas Bowl playing being played in Houston. Uh, Ole Miss doesn't seem to have any better, neither does Tech really. Both these teams seemingly pretty intact going into this game, at least as of now. That seems to be what we are expecting. Uh, sideline says this should be Ole Miss minus 2.4. We're gonna grab the three and a half with Tech. Both these teams are decent. Ole Miss probably the better team. Um, I'm putting at Tech, you see that on the screen there. Um, I'm giving Tech a half of home field advantage. I do think there will be a lot of tech fans there. Um, they tend to show up in droves in games in Houston and in the DFW area. They have a, a lot of alum um, in that area. Tech Tech's a very large school. And so a lot of people in that area. So I expect a lot of tech fans there, uh, a little bit more of a friendly atmosphere for techs. So I'm giving them a little bit of a boost there because I think that will help them out. Uh, Ole Miss has played in a lot of really big bowl games of late, you know, Sugar Bowl. Um, I, I'm not saying they won't show up. I'm not saying the fans won't show up, but I just, I'm not as, it's a little bit less of a big deal for them from a motivation standpoint, from a fans of going to a big game. But like I said, I think there'll be a lot of tech fans there. So a little bit of a boost there. We're going to grab the three and a half, just a smart play of grabbing the field goal and the hook. Cause Jared, what do you think? I'm not a statistician, but the word variance comes to mind with this game uh, mm -hmm. because I mm -hmm. think anything could happen, especially with how both of these teams go for it on fourth down. One team could get all the fourth downs. One team could not get any. It could be a blowout. But one thing we talked about, both teams could not get any of their fourth downs. And this game yeah. could end up being really low scoring or, or at least much more low scoring than, than one would anticipate. I think when you've got a game like that where there's so much variability, grab the three and a half points. I think it makes a lot of sense in this spot. Who knows? Uh, you know. This game's going to be crazy. Take take the yeah. uh, three and a half points whenever you can. This is where I, we talk about the Tuesday night game, Oklahoma State, Wisconsin. Go to bed early, get some rest. Yeah. Stay up Wednesday night. Watch this one. This one should yes. be a lot of fun. Yeah. The total in this one is around seventy, and uh, you know, it's not a number we can go over because. Like you talked about the variance, there's just a lot yeah. of things that can happen. And it's it's less about everything has to go right to go over and more about, I just don't know how many things are going to go wrong for each team. Yeah, um, yeah. We know tech is going to, tech is going to have the Baylor playbook against Air Force um, with regards to going for fourth downs. They go yeah. for fourth downs all of the time, no matter where on the field they are. They're, you know, 
Fourth and 15 from their own 20, they're going to punt. But, I mean, that's about it. <laughs> you yeah, know, that's yeah. probably a little bit of an overstatement. But they're going to go for a lot of fourth downs. And I don't know what that means. And it could lead to a lot of points. It could lead to less points. You just don't know. Uh, yeah. The weather, obviously, going to be fantastic with the Dome. Um, so I, I would I would probably lean over. But it's just a big number. And there's a lot of ways that you could have a long stretch without a lot of points. And the game lands somewhere in the mid-60s, which is still a pretty high-scoring game. So it's a yeah. total that I think is a pass. Um, but yeah, kind of like Cousin Jared said, a lot of variance in this one. Grabbing the grabbing the hook with the field goal makes a lot of sense. Kind of like we've been doing for a lot of these yeah. games in this situation. Pairing it with a little bit of money line makes a little bit of sense too. However, you want to split your wager, you know, one-third, two-thirds, one-quarter, three-quarters, something like that, a little bit on the money line because those plus odds are, are really valuable in, in a game like this where Tech could win, I wouldn't be shocked. Ole Miss could win, I wouldn't be shocked. Who really knows? Uh, both teams are decent. Both teams have some flaws. And when yeah. you get four weeks or three weeks or whatever to prepare to exploit those flaws, you don't really know what you're going to get. Um, yeah. The last thing I want to say about this is the distractions that Ole Miss had with the whole Lane Kiffin situation, um, with the fact that they went to a, such a better bowl game last year. Uh, I, I don't know if they want to be there. I do think Tech wants to be there. So I at least feel better about that. If Ole Miss comes up out, motivated and they've had a good four weeks good three four weeks of practice Ole Miss is a really good team and Ole yep. Miss should win this game but I, I just don't know um yep. it's hard to say uh, maybe you know something about the program maybe you've got some inside information there uh but I guarantee Tech wants to be at this bowl game I guarantee yep. they're pumped yep. they're gonna they've been practicing hard and yep. uh that's the side I'd rather be on at plus odds just because of that I don't want to lay odds with the team that I'm not really sure if they show up yep which takes us to Thursday afternoon game here up in the Bronx 2 p.m. Eastern, Minnesota at Syracuse. Minnesota is a nine and a half point favorite with a little bit of juice on it. Sideline says it should be 11.7. Uh, Minnesota is a 16th ranked team, according to the model. Syracuse, 65th. So, I mean, this is just one where Syracuse has just been tumbling down mm-hmm. over the last month or two of the season. We're going to lay it with Minnesota. We're also going to go under 41 and a half. When you look at who's out in this game, for Syracuse, they've lost their leading rusher had over a thousand yards. Um, they've also got um, a couple of uh, uh, one of the a receiver out. They've got a couple of defensive players out. Minnesota, a couple of key defenders out as well. But I'm not really sure that matters. I get Syracuse with how weak their offense is going to get a Syracuse offense without their best running back. Um, we don't really know if Tanner Morgan's going to play at this point. Uh, quarterback from Minnesota, a backup looked not bad. Looked you know. A little bit worse, but not a huge drop off. Not a drop off that we, as we saw, uh, other schools potentially have. You know, talking about Grayson McCall, not not that big of a drop off yeah, to the next yeah. guy. Um, really, I just don't trust Syracuse, and so yeah. we're gonna lay the nine and a half. We're also gonna go under 41 and a half, 41, a quasi key number. The weather looks decent in the Bronx. Actually, it looks like it's gonna be in the low 40, sunny, not a lot of wind. Shockingly, because this game has been played in some terrible conditions in yep. years past, but it seems like a nice weather game. Um, but just one where uh, Minnesota, I, I, I was, I was I personally I was a little hesitant with the under. And then I thought back to myself, Minnesota was mostly an under machine. Their defense was so good. Yep. And yep. I know they've got a couple guys out, but I just don't trust Syracuse to score whatsoever. And if Syracuse only scores 10 points, I don't, you know, laying a number less than 10 and going under seems like the play. Uh, Cousin Jordan, yep. what do you think? Yep. This game to me has like 24 to 10 written all over it i think that syracuse is going to have a really hard time getting the ball moving so uh let, let's lay the nine and a half points and, and let's go under 41 and a half i just again this is mostly a play on i i don't think syracuse is very good they've fallen off second half of the season and we talk about people having bags of tricks if there's one person that i think's got tricks it's pj mm-hmm. Fleck. I think that he's going to have this team pretty, pretty motivated. So uh, I'm calling it right now, 24 to 10, Minnesota's going to win this one. I I like it. It it does feel like a game that if the weather was bad, like it usually is this time of year in New York, it could be one of those like six to three type games. That's where it would be heading if it was windy and snowy, but the weather should allow some points. I just think that people might be looking at the weather and saying, Oh, the weather's nice. We're going to have points. It's like, I don't know. You look at these teams. I don't think it matters where they play. They're yeah. going to have a hard time scoring points. Like yeah. yep. Minnesota has done it on the ground. And I think that's the difference that they've done it on the ground all season. Eventually they will break through and get some big runs and get some, some offense going that way um, against Syracuse. But uh, I, I don't trust them to score a lot because they haven't been a high scoring team. And like I said, I just don't mm-hmm. trust Syracuse to score hardly at all. So kind of, you can yep. see the intersection we're talking about here, laying the points of Minnesota, the game under, we kind of like the Syracuse team total under as well. Not an official pick, but you can read that. And that would be the implication. That would be a solid investment too. If team totals are, are your thing. 
Thursday, 5 p.m. Eastern, Oklahoma at Florida State. Florida State's a nine and a half point favorite. This one is out in Orlando, Florida, the Camping World Stadium at the Cheez It Bowl. Uh, the Oklahoma's got a handful of guys out uh, running back for them, who's one of the better running backs in the country. Um, a couple starting tackles, defensive linemen. Um, Florida State doesn't seem to have anybody out. They've got a handful. Most everybody seems to be playing for Florida State. Uh, that matters. Also, good night. Does Oklahoma really care about this game whatsoever? I mean, talk about one of the – this is one of the I – can't, I can't believe I'm going to say this. This is one of the like, five mo- worst Oklahoma seasons in the last like 50 years, which is yeah. crazy to imagine how just how yeah. good they have been year in and year out. And this is just a terrible season for them, six and six. So they still rank some 26, but Florida State was just – Kick and tail later on in the season. They're ranked 13th. Now, sometimes says this should only be 7.7, but when you account in all the extra guys that Oklahoma is losing, plus a motivational factor, plus a little bit of a home field type edge for Florida State, uh, a lot of alum for Florida State in the Orlando area, uh, short travel distance from Tallahassee, and Oklahoma fans that are not going to travel to this game. They're going to save their money for next year when they expect to be playing in the Sugar Bowl or in the Cotton Bowl or in the whatever. Yeah, the, not a lot of them going to be traveling to this game. Um, yeah. You might get a few who are like, let's go to Disney World, right? And go to the game. But I mean, I don't think it's going to be very many. Um, yeah. So again, a half home field advantage for Florida State uh, in a game that I just don't trust Oklahoma one bit. And Florida State was just so incredible at the end of the season and mostly the whole team showing up. So I don't see why that doesn't continue here into the bowl game, right? Yeah, no, I definitely agree. And you have no idea how happy it makes me that during the season, it's very hard to convince you to go against sideline on a pick. And here during bowl season, mm. obviously lots of other factors. So you got to do it. So yeah, this Florida State team has been so hot here at the end of the season. You can just like see them kind of punching Oklahoma in the mouth early in this game. Oklahoma getting down and just not being able to come back. And I think that's exactly uh, what's going to happen. So I I love laying the nine and a half points with Florida state here. Uh, I think there's a lot of optimism around the Florida state program for the first time in quite a while. I think that's going to translate over to this, this bowl game and not that Oklahoma doesn't have something to look forward to. They had a good recruiting class. Uh, I'm sure they think that year two is going to be much better, but definitely this season is like, let's all agree Oklahoma is ready for the season to be over. So it's oh, like, absolutely. okay, let's, you know, this is one of those things like, okay, get down early and then just like simulate to end of game it is kind <laughs> of what I think Oklahoma is going to do in this one. So yeah, let's lay the nine and a half points. I think you got a team that's really excited about the future and excited about this game. And then one thing that's just like, yeah, for this season, let's be done with it. Yeah, absolutely. Without gray for Oklahoma being such a key piece of that offense. Uh, yeah. It's all on Dylan Gabriel. Uh, he's a good yeah, quarterback. Yeah. Uh, don't get me wrong, but I mean, if Oklahoma State's any chance, he is going to have to put this entire team on his shoulders. And uh, yeah. given how good Florida State looked, that's just not a bet that I want to make personally. I don't. No, you'd have to no. give me, you'd have to give me a ton of points in this one for me to think that Oklahoma was worth an investment because this is one that I feel like could get ugly. Which is what you're looking for when you're laying a number like basically ten. It's nine and a half with a bunch of juice here at Bet Online. There's a lot of tens out there. I think laying the ten at better odds is just as just as good i don't think there's really yep. a big difference there yep. um but if you're laying basically 10 you want it you want to feel like this one might get really ugly and absolutely I, if i had to pick one game to get ugly uh this bowl season with regards to just a runaway it's this one i kind of feel like it's very similar to the oregon state florida game where you know one team wanted to be there and looked good and the other team didn't yep. <laughs> and it was yep. kind of a runaway and i feel yep. like that's kind of what we're looking at there the late game Thursday at night, 9 p.m. Eastern, the Alamo Bowl, Washington at Texas. Texas is a three and a half point favorite, but at even money. Sideline says this should be Texas minus 9.8. Texas, without their top two running backs, obviously their number one running back will be a first round draft pick. Um, just an incredible talent. And number two, not far behind them. Also a very good running back. I think Texas has got some running backs behind them, though. I think Texas has yeah, got running backs yeah. running through their ears. So I'm not really sure that matters much. I think the biggest issue in this game is, is Ewers for Texas. After that really good start where we thought he's going to be the reason why Texas can get back to prominence, the back half of the season was somewhere between mediocre and terrible. And yeah. the good games were mediocre. And that was kind of like maybe the Baylor game. He was mediocre, but just had some real stinkers as well. Graded out overall for the season. Not that good, you know, very just yeah. mediocre and not what you expect at a contending power five team. And yep. that's going to be the issue for Texas more than the running backs is the fact that the issue for Texas is going to be that the quarterback is still there. Not that the running backs are not there, which is crazy to say. Yeah. Because the better quarterback of the two Hudson card has entered the transfer portal. And so yep. he's the guy that you'd probably rather actually have 
playing in this game if you're a Texas fan. So that's going to be the biggest issue with them. They are missing probably their best defensive player as well, Overshone, who's going to the draft. Um, that also kind of matters. Washington seems mostly intact. Uh, a really good passing offense for Washington, and that's going to be yeah. what Texas stop. As much hand-wringing as there's been over Texas this season, though, they went 8-4 and four against the spread this year. I mean, that doesn't screen to me a team that we all thought would be really good and wasn't. Yeah, Maybe that's what the talking heads were thinking, but when you go to what really matters, which isn't, I'm sorry, what Kirk Herbstreit says on TV or what Pat McAfee says on TV, and those guys are entertaining, yeah. absolutely, and, and, and no disrespect to them, but what they say isn't what matters. What matters is what the spread is because that's the real indicator of how the – how the teams are perceived yeah and texas covered eight games and didn't cover four so i mean i i think there's the, the narrative that you know texas is underperformed or whatever i'm not really sure how true that is uh washington obviously had a great season 10 and 2 um yeah. fantastic year for them i've got them ranked 20th the issue is as much as texas was eight and four on the season with regards to projecting forward they still project forward as the fifth best team going forward that's a full strength texas oh, team God. this isn't quite a full yeah. strength team yeah, seeing that five next to Texas gives me a headache. It, it is a little hard to believe. Um, they've got a lot of talent when they put it all together. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The biggest yeah. issue is the quarterback play. And that, yeah. I think, is going to be the difference in this one. If they get mediocre quarterback play, their defense is good enough to stop this Washington attack. Washington's defense is bad enough that Texas should score. But yeah. if Ewers makes mistakes, misses his key, you know, you know, got to stay ahead of the chains, that sort of thing. Yeah. Misses third down passes. A lot of it's the game plan too. We talked a lot about on this show about the Texas game plan. When they've really tried to let viewers be the focus of this offense, they haven't played well. When they've yeah. really focused on, we've got great linemen and great running backs, and let's get the ball to these guys in space. And I know without their top two, they still have other guys that they can do that with. They've played a lot better. So a lot's going to be the game plan and the quarterback and how that plays out for Texas. In general, Texas yeah. has too much talent. We're going to lay the three and a half with them as much yeah. as that's a scary proposition. Yeah, I, I think that's the perfect uh, parallel perfectly into what I was going to say, which was if you just look at the quarterbacks, I understand your uh, concern with laying the three and a half points here because Penix is a, a great quarterback. But yeah. but the thing is, is I think when you look around the totality of the team, the talent that Texas has everywhere else, I think it's just so much better than, than what Washington has. Um, I think Washington is still kind of going through the phase of they had Chris Peterson as the head coach. He was not necessarily the best recruiter. He was a great developer of the talent that he got. And I think that unless you have somebody like Chris Peterson, don't get me wrong, DeBoer is a, a great, great offensive coach. Coach, but it's just not quite to the level of, of player development as Chris Peterson was. As DeBoer gets his own players in there and everything, I think you can see that change. But right now, I just think that Texas has so much more talent. And if you kind of just set the quarterback play aside, like you mentioned, Texas can maybe game plan around that a little bit. I think that the talent Texas has elsewhere is going to be enough to carry this in a game that's in San Antonio where I can guarantee you there's going to be quite a few Longhorn fans there. So again, you see the ad on the screen. They're giving Texas a half half of the home field advantage because it will be a lot of burnt orange. There'll be a lot of Texas fans there yeah. uh, for that one. It's about an hour up the road, depending on exactly where you live in Austin and yeah, what time of day you drive, given the traffic on 35. But yeah. I think and the last thing I want to say about this is if Texas blows this game, I think it will be solely because the, on the coaching staff, they mm -hmm. have to know what they have with yours at this point, which is a very yeah. mediocre at best quarterback. And that doesn't mean he can't be better next year. He's shown yeah. flashes. But if they decide to let him air it out as a we're prepping for next year, we want that sort of thing, and we don't care if we win this game because we got to see if after three weeks of practice, if he makes better reads and better throws, it gets dicey. Yeah. But if this coaching staff wants to win this bowl game, they have they have they're smart individuals. I know we give coaches a lot of a lot of grief, and they make some boneheaded decisions, absolutely. But mm -hmm. these are all smart people. They watch a lot of film. They they have to know what they have with Ewers. They and we saw them adjust yeah. as the season went along with their game plan, and if they game plan correctly with knowing what they have with yours they win this game and they probably win yep. by more than a field goal because they're just a much more talented team and they can just roll on their athleticism yeah, yeah so well if they but, lose but, it's on the coach but but what does next season matter when you've got arch manning coming in yeah <laughs> i'm saying Which, that mostly jokingly but also maybe not jokingly i'm not sure maybe Maybe not jokingly, as my dad talked again as a, as a Longhorn alum has talked a lot about that with Manning coming in. Who knows with that situation? Yeah. And there was, uh, you know, there was already talk at the start of the season that Ewers might transfer to a better place um, yeah. up from here with Manning coming in. With how he's looked, I'm not sure who would want him. I mean, yeah. Uh, 
you, you saw you saw DJ struggles going to Oregon State. I feel like Ewers is in yeah. a similar boat. He wouldn't be going to a school any better than Oregon State, that's for sure. Yep. All right, to the Friday slate, Noon Eastern Maryland at NC State, a game that we think is going to lack in points with regards to the spread. So I think this is Maryland minus three. Maryland's missing a few more guys. Talk about that in a second than NC State is. So if I were to take that minus three and drop it down a little bit, maybe Maryland should be about a one point favorite. They're getting a point right now. It's not enough to be excited about either direction. I think Maryland's the better team at full strength. Again, they're at less full strength than NC state is overall got them ranked 30th NC state 52nd. Uh, you know, both teams had a, had a decent season uh, Maryland. I think with worse expectations, probably pretty happy at seven and five or content at seven and five NC state, I think had better aspirations, but even with Leary and could never really get things going. And then when he went out, things just got even worse. But the thing that NC state still does have is a really good defense, Maryland, pretty good offense and is likely to have Tulia playing, but they are missing their top two wide receivers. Um, and another receiver who had 40 catches as well. So uh, we're left with, um, you know, uh, an NC State team that struggled to score already, and yeah. not really sure who's going to quarterback for them. Um, if it's if it's Morris or if it's one of the other guys, but they were all mostly pretty bad. Um, and a Maryland team that won't be at full strength on offense, so we're going to go under forty six. Really like being above those key numbers of forty four and forty five. Because uh, Jared, what do you think? I think that Maryland's offense was so up and down this season that. I mean, having their top three receivers out, I think it's really going to hurt them a lot because th those top two receivers are going to be early round draft picks, talking about top half of the draft. So I think there's just a lot of talent there. And I think NC State, it, it, for as bad as the quarterback play has been this season since Leary got hurt, they've just found ways to, to hang in games and even win some games that they shouldn't have. I don't know where this one's going to fall, but I do feel quite confident this game is going to be low scoring. This definitely feels like it's going to be 23-20 one way or the other, and we don't really care who, who wins this one. Uh, let's just stay under that, that 46 number. I just think that the main thing here being – Maryland had more offensive potential, but I think that went out the door when when their three uh, three receivers opted out for the draft. And so I just think that the, the cap on points in this game is going to be pretty low. Should be pretty nice weather. Uh, this one's going to be played in Charlotte. So location-wise, is not bad for both teams. Obviously, a little bit further from Maryland, but not that far. Um, and obviously, just down the road for NC State. So, um, you know, a Charlotte area that sometimes gets rough weather at this time of year, but we're right now projecting about 60 degrees, not really much wind. Uh, so it should be very nice weather in a game. As you can see, again on stream, I am giving NC state a little bit of a home field edge, knowing how close they are expecting a little bit easier time of travel and a little bit more fans there. So that gives them a little bit of a boost. I'm like you, I don't really know what will happen. If this game was in a different location, um, you know, this was up in Annapolis rather than, in yep. Charlotte or with, uh, you know, Maryland having maybe one of those guys at least playing. Uh, I, I think Maryland can get it done as it is. I'm not really sure. It seems very coin tossy, um, yep. but it doesn't, it seems like either or both teams could have a really hard time scoring in this. Yeah. One. Yep. Which is to the 2 PM Eastern game, uh, Pittsburgh and UCLA. One of the few games, not on ESPN. This is the Sun Bowl out yeah. at El Paso. Um, Pittsburgh's losing their all-American defensive lineman from injury. Slovis is in the transfer portal. To be fair, I'm not really sure how much better Slovis is than the second and third stringers for Pitt. Uh, I, I, we talked about this earlier in the season, that there was still kind of an open quarterback battle, um, kind of with all three guys uh, at the start yeah. of the season. So uh, maybe it's a little bit of a downgrade, but it's probably not a huge one. I think the um, obviously losing an All-American defensive lineman is a bigger deal. Um, yeah. uh, one of Their starting safety is out. They're also without a defensive end, without a linebacker, made almost 100 tackles, and a running back who had 1,400 yards. Um, th that's... That's, that's a lot. That's a lot yeah. that Pitt's losing. Yeah. Aside from Slovis, if I'm wrong about Slovis, it's even more, you know? And so yeah. uh, they'll obviously have some decent guys behind them, but it's, you know, it's a drop here and a drop there and a drop there and a drop there. And that kind of all adds up. Uh, UCLA, um, for the most part, only without one wide receiver. Otherwise, everything else seems mostly on track for them. Uh, we're going to lay the five and a half with UCLA in a game that's looking like it might have some wind. Uh, and it looks like some cross winds uh, up towards 30 miles an hour. And so uh, we're out enough ways away now that we're not 100% about that, but we're close enough that that's looking pretty likely. I think that's why the total's dropping. Want to get this in under 
before the number continues to drop. You see on screen there, under 52 and a half is one way to look. The way we're actually going to play this, though, is we're going to play UCLA minus five and a half. And instead of the game under, which I think is a perfectly reasonable play, especially above a key number like 52 and a half, is instead we're going to play the pit team total under. We locked it in at under 25 and a half with a little bit of juice, whether it's 24 and a half, 23 and a half. Either way, the team total for Pitt is the official play along with UCLA. But if you want to go full game, that makes sense. I think we just like the Pitt team total under angle a little bit more because we don't have to really care if UCLA scores 40 or not because we know they're yeah. going to score no matter when or not. They should be able to run the ball all day on this yeah. Pitt team. Right? Yeah. Yeah, so that's my concern with UCLA. I'm not con convinced that that Chip Kelly doesn't want to just run for 400 yards every game anyway and throw he the ball. Probably wants to, yeah. Times, and, and so the wind might just allow them to do that. And I think that UCLA could just wear Pitt out on the ground if they really wanted to. And so, uh, love the UCLA side. That definitely my, my favorite play in this game. I feel a lot more comfortable isolating the pit uh, team total under uh, just because you, you mentioned a, a lot of what they're missing. And, and I think that could really come back to bite them. And also UCLA can just, like I said, run for 400 yards. UCLA could put up, you know, 42 points in this game. And this game can end up like 42 to 14 and you just barely lost the 52 and a half. Uh, but, you know, uh, anyway. All I have to say, I like the, the pit team total under more more than the game uh, under here. But yeah, love love UCLA as well. Uh, I think this just, I mean, I think Pitt's outmatched in this one, honestly. Yeah, Southern says this should be UCLA minus 5.3. But again, UCLA mostly healthy, maybe again, just losing one receiver um, in a game with the win that may not, he may not be able to have much of an impact anyway. But Pitt losing yeah. so many pieces on both sides of the ball. You have to assume that really this should be north of a touchdown. I'm really surprised it hasn't gotten there. UCLA is the much better team. Um, don't really know how many UCLA scores, but it's just, it's hard to see Pitt without their leading running back. Um, without their quarterback with wind also without a receiver yeah. like i just don't know how they're going to score it, yeah. against a defense that has allowed a lot of points this season but um the pitch just doesn't seem like they're really primed to take advantage of that I, against a different caliber of offensive opponent is the way that i i would yeah. clar clarify that because we we, we I, this season, how much more time did we spend talking about the Pac-12 this season than we have in, in seasons past? And that's a lot, almost a lot. exclusively because of the offenses were, were great in, in the conference this yeah. season. So uh, I, I think UCLA, with their defensive issues this year, have just been against a different caliber of offense. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Friday afternoon, 3.30 Eastern. South Carolina is playing Notre Dame. Notre Dame is a two-point favorite. We're going to lay the two there. Southern says it should be a little bit north of three. This one is going to be played out in Jacksonville, Florida, in the Gator Bowl. Um, both teams losing some guys, but it looks like South Carolina is losing a little bit more. I'll kind of read it off here. Um, we've got a couple. We've got a tight end out, a defensive end out for Notre Dame. They're losing Drew Pine transferring, but the original starter, Tyler Buckner, is back. So that offsets that a little bit. Obviously, I think we all think that Pine was the better quarterback, but probably not by a ton. Um, yeah. All those things definitely downgrade Notre Dame. But South Carolina um, losing their offensive coordinator. Um, both of their tight ends, a uh, receiver because of a knee injury, their leading running back, uh, a defensive lineman who's prepping for the NFL draft, uh, an edge rusher who's in the transfer portal, uh, starting quarterback to the draft, um, you know, a, sa a safety, um, a starting tackle. It's a lot for South Carolina, and they close the season really strong, but I, I just have to think they're missing a little bit more than Notre Dame is. So sometimes it should be Notre Dame minus three, and when you look at how much more South Carolina is missing, I kind of feel like maybe it should be Notre Dame minus four or five. I'm surprised this is under a field goal. Uh, I think people are getting a little bit too caught up in the South Carolina feel-good story that was their last two victories, um, and I think laying the two with Notre Dame just makes too much sense knowing everything that South Carolina is missing kind of puts it all on the shoulders of one Spencer Rattler who – I know who had Sorry. some good games Sorry, at that the end. <laughs> That's kind of the point is I know we yeah. had some good games at the end, but I mean, I'll take my chances. And if Spencer Rattler beats us, then we just say, all right, Spencer Rattler beat us. Yeah. Let's move on. But, but he, he's missing a lot of the pieces that yeah. helped him in those games. And I, and I think as we talked about the, what we learned with South Carolina in those last few games is that if Spencer Rattler plays well, the rest of the team around him was actually pretty good. A lot of that team that's really good around him, half those guys are out now, it seems. So yeah. that also affects it. Now it makes, again, a little bit more on Rattler. It's not about if Rattler is average. Now they actually need Rattler to play a little bit better. I guess a pretty solid Notre Dame defense, one that maybe not quite as good as in years past, but still not a bad one. Because, uh, yep. Jared, what's your take? 
Yeah, so if you would have asked me about this game beforehand, before you read off all the people that were missing for, for South Carolina, I would have said that Notre Dame is, I feel like, one of the most consistent teams. You kind of know exactly what you're getting with Notre Dame. And South Carolina is the exact opposite. You have no idea what you're going to get from South Carolina week to week. And so that would have made me think if I can lay less than a touch, or excuse me, if I can lay less than a field goal, I would have laid it with Notre Dame. If I were getting more than a field goal, I probably would have taken the points with South Carolina. Then you just read off all the stuff that about South Carolina, all the players that they're missing, putting more of the game on Spencer Rattler, who, like you said, lost his offensive coordinator, even with how well he was playing there at the end of the season. I assume that losing your offensive coordinator, somebody that you kind of built up that rapport with, was probably not the best. Um, anyway, adding well, or all so, that or, on there. Or maybe, and, and you know, sometimes these are overblown. You never really know. But maybe a little bit of that guy has seen him all season. And by the end of the season, maybe he had kind of figured out, hey – Here's yeah. when we do this based off of what I'm seeing when he's yeah. missing throws this way. Here's how we do, you know, maybe he's, yeah. maybe not, maybe I'm crazy, right? Maybe it doesn't really yeah. matter, but there's a chance he's seen those things and that he's learned all that over the course of the season, figured that out. Now that guy's gone. And so now the guy who's playing calls doesn't have that insight about his quarterback. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think that you might be losing a little bit more than you think there with the offense coordinator being gone. Anyway, all of that just adds to the fact that if I can, if I can lay less than a touchdown with Notre Dame, I love it. So only got to lay two points here. Sure. I think Notre Dame is the more consistent team, uh, you know, laying less than a field goal. I, I like Notre Dame here. This, this feels like a spot where South Carolina is getting a little bit too much respect for how they ended the season and not saying that they aren't deserving of that respect, but I think that just but so that much team isn't showing up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And just a variable team to begin with. Yeah, absolutely. One that I think, uh, again, the future's looking up for them, uh, as yeah. much promise as we've seen from them in, in in quite a while, I feel like, or close to it at least, with how yeah. they finish that season. But yeah, you got to now rebuild and regroup with all the new guys that you're going to have to get because you, you, you know, you're, you're out a lot of those key yeah. players in this bowl game. Yeah. Uh, Friday at 4.30 Eastern, Wyoming versus Ohio. Um, this is the... Arizona Bowl. This is the one that's only being streamed, so hmm. um, it's like they don't want it to exist. I guess I don't really know. Um, maybe these two teams don't want it to exist. I, I don't really know. Ohio was all Rourke. He was what made that offense go, and he uh, is out from a season-ending knee injury, so he won't be there for o Ohio. That is a massive loss for them. But you know what is a massive loss for Wyoming? The fact that it appears that they're expected to be without their top. Four running backs. I have no idea who's going to play running back for them, but that's not necessarily idea. They're also missing their leading receiver. Um, they're also leading a defensive end that had six and a half sacks and a couple of quarterbacks. So Wyoming's taking the approach of let's let's lose a lot of guys in a lot of different ways. Ohio is just like, why don't we just play without our best player? And obviously they didn't choose that, but that's what it feels like. Two teams that weren't already good to start with. Um, Wyoming seven and five ranked one hundredth. Ohio nine and four ranked eighty fifth. And again, they were partially ranked eighty fifth because of Rourke. Rourke without yeah. him, they're probably a lot lower than that. This could be ugly football. Um, I wouldn't really encourage you to find this game. Streaming wise, because I don't think you're yeah. going to be missing much. Um, yeah. It's going to be really ugly. We're going to lay the one with Ohio. Bottom line is sideline says Ohio minus 4.6. And I know that Rourke is a big loss, but also Wyoming's losses add up to a lot. So my thought is yeah. penalize both teams the same. And Ohio still should be favored by more than one. Really, I think you should be favored by about three in this game. At three, you start thinking three and a half. You really start going, I don't yeah. really know. I'll lay the one with Ohio. Uh, they've at least been playing without with their backup quarterback. Yeah. Um, yep. Wyoming losing a lot of these guys here, I feel like is not ideal for them uh, again in a game that if it didn't exist, you know, maybe none of us would even know the difference to be honest. Yeah. So I think Ohio here, obviously work great player. They've had some runtime with their backup quarterback. And if you take out last season, when Frank Solis retired in like July or August or something, they had a rough year last year, but historically Ohio's offense has almost been plug and play. I mean, bring in a different, not different quarterback every year, but they're just very consistent on offense. They're usually very good. I think that I still have some faith in Ohio's offense, even without Rourke. We talked about Utah State earlier benefiting from playing in the Mountain West. Want to know another team that benefited from playing in the Mountain West this year? That's Wyoming. Uh, they won like four out of their last five games. But let me read off who some of those victories were against: New Mexico, New Mexico, Utah State, Hawaii, Colorado State, and then when they actually played um, two more real teams toward the end of the season, Boise State and Fresno State, uh, they did not uh, exactly equip themselves well in those games. So I just think that. Ohio's offense, even without Rourke, is going to be a little bit too much for this Wyoming team. I mean, can Wyoming ugly this game up and find a way to come out to win? Sure. But I think more times than not, you know, Ohio's going to put up like 
27 points or something like that. And that's really going to be on the cusp of what Wyoming is capable yeah. of getting. So I feel good about laying the, the one point with Ohio here. Yeah, if this was like 27-14, I would be like, sure. And yeah. how those points happen, I have no idea. No one saw it, so no, no one yeah. else knows either. But yeah. here we yeah. are. Yeah. Uh, to the Friday night game, 8 p.m. Eastern, Clemson at Tennessee. And boy, could we talk about this one for a long time. Yes. Uh, Orange Bowl down in Miami. Uh, Hooker obviously out for the season for Tennessee. I have to tell you, Milton is not bad. I mean, he's not a huge drop-off. I mean, Hooker was great. And yeah. Heisman talk-worthy. I mean, if he plays that last game, even with that, I kind of feel like he maybe should have even gotten the invite to New York, at least to throw him a bone of, you know, yeah. with the injury. No, he was fantastic. Mm-hmm. Don't want to take anything away from him, but but Mel's a pretty good quarterback too. Not a huge drop off. Tennessee's just got offense like like talk about plug and play. Yeah. That's Tennessee's offense. Um, they are losing a couple of receivers though, and so uh, they're losing the Blitnikoff Award winner. So yeah. it'll be can they actually plug and play? Is the big question there. They've also um, have a starting tackle declared for the draft, but he's going to play, so that helps. Um, so they, they're, they're losing a linebacker as well. Clemson, also with quarterback situation, we talked about DJ all season long. Yeah. Early on, looking better, looking like he's kind of putting it together, minimizing some of the mistakes, and you know, right as we start to feel confident about that, he has a terrible game. Then he kind of comes back and plays well again. Then another terrible game. He's yep. out to Oregon State. They've got a freshman coming into play who I've just personally not sold in overall. I know we, mm-hmm. he's looked good, you know, at times, but I'm just not completely sold. Um, they've also lost a lot uh, to the transfer portal, a running back, defensive back, a wide receiver. Um, they've got two key defensive guys uh, out as well. You've got a situation where I don't really know what's going to happen, but I'm not really sure why Clemson's favored by five and a half. Uh, so yep. we're going to take the five and a half with Tennessee. Sideline says it should be uh, Tennessee minus 0.7. That is accounting for Hooker not playing. It is not accounting for anything else. But when you look at what Tennessee's losing and what Clemson's losing, it's probably about the same. So, I mean, really, I think this should be a coin toss type game. We've seen Tennessee play in some wild bowl games. Um, in recent years, I kind of expect and hope this one to be pretty wild too. Uh, don't really know what happens, but give me five and a half points uh, or the equivalent money line odds. I think makes a lot of sense. Because uh, what is your take on this one? Are are we really convinced that Cade Klubnik is, is that good? You know, talked talk about DJ leaving. I, I'm not convinced that Klubnik is that great either, especially. Yeah only having played kind of sparingly throughout the season and then expecting him to come in here and like lay five and a half points against a good Tennessee team that I think regardless of whether hookers there or not, like this offense is still going to find a way to, to put up points. And, and so this game, I don't know, Tennessee is one of my favorite plays uh, of all of bowl season. I think, I think five and a half points is, is way too many. I am not one usually that's very invested in, in the money line, but uh money line play on Tennessee certainly wouldn't be a bad uh, option here. In my opinion, I know you're losing uh, the best two receivers for Tennessee in this game, but number one, they were without one of those players for the majority of the season anyway, or, or so it seemed. And the other thing is I really do believe like they can, Will they be as good as those two guys? No, but you can almost plug and play any receiver. Like if they are fast and have reasonably good hands, like I'm not trying to say it's simple, but like that's kind of all there is with a lot of the routes that that these guys have to run. It's like just be a fast person with with decent hands. And and you have to assume that's what they've recruited in, that they didn't just all of a sudden be like, okay, now we're going to start recruiting possession receivers. Yes, (laughs) recruiting them just having them transfer in with all the transfer rules now, like, yeah. you know, somebody, I think you would be crazy to tell yourself uh, watching Hypo and this Tennessee team last season. And then a receiver being like, Hey, I want to transfer in and having some guy that transferred in after last season and has been on the bench most of this season, probably going to get a shot to, to run some more routes yeah. in this game uh, more than he has in any other games this season. So I love Tennessee here. I, I just don't think that, that Clemson, is that great. I think they're getting too much respect for club Nick making what his first, first or second start uh, of the season here. Um, so I, yeah, it's too many points for a really good Tennessee team. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And um, it, it, you never really know how games are going to play out. Right. And I always talk about, we, we like to view games as a distribution of here's all the different ways it could play out. You know, Tennessee can win this game by 30 Clemson can win this game by 30. Those are on the tails. Those are not likely probabilities. Um, but this one seems like a distribution that's really centered around zero where anybody could win. And it feels like if you're backing Clemson, you're really talking yourself into backing a freshman quarterback who we have very limited data on. And when yeah. you look at the actual like throws he's made over the season, his totality of work isn't that impressive and actually grades out 
decently worse than DJ does. And so I, I really think it's a downgrade from DJ on the whole. Now, obviously, DJ's floor was really low because when he lost it, he just lost it completely, you know, like kind of like the yips or something, right? Mm -hmm. But in general, like I don't really think it's an upgrade at all with them at quarterback. And so you're trusting right. a freshman quarterback in a big bowl game. I know he's had some time to prepare, but I just I'd be more comfortable with him next year when it's like you got the whole offseason to grow and work. And it's yeah. like, is is three extra weeks gonna be it? I don't know. I, it, it it could be, but it just yeah. seems like that's not really where I want to have my money on yep. banking on that, you know, because that's a yep. kind of a terrifying proposition that Tennessee's with other quarterback, but the other guys played a lot. And again, it's been pretty solid. You know, I, I, yeah. I, I much prefer Tennessee's quarterback to Clemson's. And they go back to that Washington, Texas game. I much prefer Washington's quarterback over Texas, but that's like the only position on the field that I would probably say that at. Whereas right. in this game, it's like, I much prefer Tennessee's quarterback. And then here I want this guy and here I want this guy and here I want this guy. And it's kind of a mismatch after that of two really good teams. Um, right. I might lean some of Clemson's guys more than Tennessee's, but it's not overwhelming like Texas' situation. So there I can kind of overlook the quarterback because the other 21 guys in the field are mostly favoring Texas. But in this game, it's like maybe it leans Clemson, but the quarterback edge I think Tennessee has here is, is again, confusing why we're getting plus odds, why we're getting five and a half points. It doesn't make any sense to me. Definitely agree. Speaking of games that won't make any sense, noon, Saturday, Iowa and Kentucky. Um Oh boy. This is the other game. Yeah, this is the other game I mentioned. Uh, 31 is at Bet US. Uh, it's uh, widely available across the market. It's 30 and a half at Bet Online, but it's 31 just about everywhere in the world, it seems like. Uh, we're going to go under 31 because. If this game's nothing, nothing going to overtime, I mean, that would be pretty fitting. Um, yes. I, I, does this game need any setup? I mean, nope. let's talk about if these teams, yeah, if these teams are at full strength, let's talk about that first. And then we'll talk about how that's all not true. If these teams are at full strength, you've got a seven and five Iowa team that the model says is the 27th best team. And a 7-5 Kentucky team that the model says is the 34th best team. That means Iowa should be slight favorites. They are slight favorites. When you look at who's out in this game, you've got um, – for Iowa, they're missing quarterback Spencer Petrus, which I don't know if that matters. They're also losing their backup to the transfer portal. So now we're going to the third stringer who's made a grand total of as many career NCAA college pass attempts as Cousin Jared, you and I have made. Oh, wow. So that's – not ideal, but to no. be fair, I would never rely on their quarterback in any way. And I don't think he won them a yeah. single game this year. So it's not don't. like they're missing. I mean, it's a downgrade, but it's also like a downgrade that might not matter. Um, yep. They're also missing a receiver who had 18 catches. And honestly, without looking it up, 18 catches, that might be their leading receiver. <laughs> I'm just saying. Probably not true, but it's not impossible. Well, I, I assume um, they're talking to receivers who they're tied in in their fullback. Uh, but yes, <laughs> maybe they're leaving receiver for a wide receiver. Yeah. Right. Um, they also are losing a linebacker and starting safety uh, is out as well. But Kentucky losing Levis, probably not a big deal. I don't understand it whatsoever. We've talked a lot about him this season. Uh, yeah. Maybe he'll make a good, maybe he'll make a good pro quarterback. I don't really know, but like he was terrible this year. I mean, straight yeah. up just useless basically. I mean, he was probably not even in the top 50 best college quarterbacks this season. I can't believe I'm saying that, but that's how bad yeah. he was this season. So missing him, I'm not sure if that matters a ton, but you know what does matter? Starting running back Chris Rodriguez Jr., who actually was their workhorse as a running yeah. back. Missing him matters. They're also losing a starting cornerback. Um, I think you either convince yourself that Iowa is – missing or Kentucky missing as much as Iowa or more Iowa minus two and a half just makes too much sense here they're taking steam a little bit here and I think it's the right move this was pl Iowa plus two and a half early on in bowl season would have loved to have gotten two and a half I'd love them at pick yeah. them I still love them here less than three I don't think there's gonna be a lot of points because these two teams couldn't score when they were fully functional yeah. how are they yeah. gonna score now yeah. um but I also just I just do not see Kentucky scoring. They they just they lost the only guy on offense that helped them in Rodriguez, and yep. I think that really matters. Whereas Iowa losing their quarterbacks probably not great, but also their quarterbacks are so terrible anyway. It doesn't really matter yep. much, right? Yep. And I, I would also say that Kentucky is also uh, down to their third string running back because their their uh, backup running back Kavasia Smoke also uh, entered the transfer portal, and so they're down to their third string running back. Which again, not exactly setting a third running third string running back up for success when haven't gotten any help from the quarterback position. Uh, also, and going against Iowa, <laughs> going against Iowa, like, yes. And, and yeah. if there's anything you can Best count on, in the country, yes, Iowa is going to get some 
turnover inside of you know the Kentucky's 20 yard line or they're going to block a punt or, or something like that they're going to get up set up with good field position and they're going to end up with like at least I don't know three or six points out of that a couple field goals maybe or you know God forbid an actual entire touchdown from that and that's going to be the difference in a game like this and so yeah I love laying the points with with Iowa to your point they've done it all season without any quarterback play that's worth writing home about uh at least Kentucky you think whoever's starting at quarterback will be a downgrade from what Levis was at least like, gosh I hope so I don't know why they stuck with yeah, Levis so yeah, long yeah. if the backup was worth, worth a flip and this just kind of feels like Kentucky this feels like a different kind of game with those players that they're missing for Iowa this feels just like any other Iowa game <laughs> yeah, and so absolutely. let's just take the under and, and let's uh lay the two and a half points yeah, and I have a couple more things I want to talk about. Mainly, I want to talk about this game forever because this game is going to be so gloriously terrible. Um, I'm going to love every second of it. Um, yeah. First off, again, I, I want to reiterate, Levis might be a great NFL quarterback. I'm not saying you won't be. I have no idea. I don't scout for that. I don't know mm. what tools you need for that. I have no idea. He might be a great NFL quarterback. Bottom line is he was terrible this year. There's really no denying that. And that matters for trying to project how they've done into how they're going to do in this game. They aren't losing much without him, which is, again, crazy right. to say, given that he's projected to be a first-round draft pick. Again, might be a good pro wasn't good this year. Um, you talk about Iowa getting a safety, a blocked punt, an interception, something like that. And we joke about that a lot. They do get a lot of those, but you know why they get a lot of those? Because they play a lot of garbage offenses. Think about yeah. the division they play in. They play in the Big Ten West. They play yeah. a lot of yeah. garbage offenses. So what do you what so they get a lot of pick sixes. So yeah. they get a lot of fumbles in their own territory. When they play yeah. Ohio State, that didn't happen. When they played Michigan, yeah. that didn't happen. Well, let me tell you, Kentucky ain't Michigan or Ohio State. Kentucky yeah. lines up offensively yeah. and defensively. They have a good defense. Don't get me wrong. That's why we like the under because Iowa's yeah. offense is bad and they're not going to score much either. Yeah. But it's not just a joke about, oh, Iowa's probably going to get a safety or Iowa's probably going to get a, you know, a pick six or whatever. It's like when you play a bad offense like they played – half of the season in their conference, like they're playing here, that's what they do because that's what good defenses yeah. do. Good defenses force turnovers against bad offenses. Guess what? Because he's got a bad offense. So I don't okay. want people to hear that and just be like, oh, they're just saying that that's not going to continue. Like it may or may not. Turnovers are a little bit fluky, but Iowa puts themselves in position to get those turnovers because of the way they play, because of how good they are. They can be a little aggressive. And when you're playing yeah. a bad offense, bad offenses turn the ball over. And that's exactly what we have here. So the probability of something like that happening is actually pretty high. Like Iowa yeah. is fairly likely to have a defensive touchdown or set themselves up for an easy def uh, offensive score or set themselves up for field goals. Because obviously if this game was like nine to three, that wouldn't surprise me yeah. <laughs> either with these two teams. Um, whether, uh, you know, should not be, uh, as big of a deal in this one because we don't expect either team to pass the ball very much anyway. <laughs> so we are a little bit further out now on this one talking about Saturday's game. It is in Nashville sometimes. Tennessee weather gets a little bit rougher, so it's a little bit harder to predict. But I don't think the weather really matters in this one because neither team is going to pass the ball with any success whatsoever anyway. Right. So this is just a, these two offenses are terrible. Um, last thing I want to talk about here, a friend of the show, and I'll call him a friend because, you know, we talk on Twitter sometimes. Um, Bill Connolly, uh, who does SP Plus, his projection system projects this game to have 26 points. And that is mm. just amazing. And yeah, yeah. Hilarious and sad. And oh, by the way, his projection system, like mine, doesn't account for opt out. So it isn't even acknowledging the fact that Iowa's on their third string quarterback, Kentucky's right. on their backup quarterback, Kentucky's on their third string running back. And it still wow. says 26 points. This yeah. game. If it has points, I'm going to be sad. I don't know about yeah. you. I'm going to be sad. Yeah. If there's, if there's I, I definitely agree. And this is definitely an example of like you watch football long enough, you will see everything. Uh, because <laughs> we, like literally like what confluence of events had to have occurred to get a game with a projection of 26 points. That's okay. Yeah. It, that's that's not an uh, academy, a, 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 a you know, an academy right. triple option game okay but uh, even those, then those uh, still project to have 30 something i think on his projection systems i've never seen yes, a projection this like that's great that, that's true and those projections are wrong for those games uh but yeah <laughs> yes. this one between like two teams who are like supposed to run like a semblance of an offense that the other team isn't completely 100 percent built to stop uh, and yeah it's just this is just crazy this is just crazy it is. And I don't, I don't know. I can't remember who I saw this on, on Twitter. Uh, so it's not mine. I'm not, I'm not the person to come up with this original content, but somebody did a write up for every bowl game about one thing to be grateful for about the bowl mm. game. And the thing that they came up, did you see this? The thing that they came I, up with I, for this game, 
the thing they came up for this game was to be grateful that these two teams are playing each other. So they only ruin one bowl game rather than playing other teams mm. and ruining two bowl games. And I was like that, mm. but yes, that, but that's why I'm grateful to watch it. Cause it's going to be so spectacularly terrible. I hope it is. Yeah. If it's not again, if there's like, if this is a competent, like, you know, 27 to 21 football game, I'm going to be pretty sad. Like I, it's yeah, not what yeah. I'm here to see. Like I can see that nine, uh, nine out of 10 other games. I can see that nonsense. I want to see terrible football in this one because that's what it sets up to be. And, and actually terrible, great defenses, fantastic defenses. I don't want to take it away from that. And that's part of yeah. it is I want to see the good defenses. Cause we don't, we see, all, we see, we don't see uh, the defenses get to just tee off like this right. in a lot of games, you know? Yep. Uh, that's going to wrap us up with, 12 Eastern Kansas State versus Alabama. We have covered uh, the semifinal games. Those were in a standalone episode. Jake was on with us as well. We gave out picks for those. Numbers haven't moved too much. You still probably get pretty similar numbers out there. Check that episode if you haven't yet. So this is the last episode. The last one on this episode, we will cover the games in the new year in another episode. There's about four or five of them left and the national championship game. We will cover that in a week from now. So this is going to wrap us up here. Saturday noon, Eastern Kansas State and Alabama. In the, um, what is this, the Sugar Bowl? Sugar Bowl, yeah. Sugar Bowl. Um, Alabama having Bryce Young and Will Anderson playing, supposedly, is a big deal. And I know both those guys said that. Would it surprise you if either one of them backed out between now and then? Like, oh, So, yes. Yes, I, it, it would surprise me if either one of them backed out between now and then. But them playing and kind of like the – the fanfare around the announcement of them playing gives uh, gives me a little bit of concern that this is going to be more like a uh, like a coronation uh, of like game. hey it's going to be yeah, an all like, star game hey, where it's just, yeah you know. like hey thank you for being here not necessarily like man we really got to go out and like win the sugar bowl I think it's more of like hey guys thanks for playing in this game y'all have the real crimson tide spirit here y'all are playing for the right reasons and not really anything to do with like hey, we need to win the Sugar Bowl kind of thing. And we do assume they both will play. The only reason I say that is we have seen in the past, it has happened before where a player has said he was going to play. And then in the time, especially when you say you're going to play weeks ahead of time, something changing their mind and Mm -hmm. that not happening. Uh, Obviously, God forbid, we hope no injury happens to them. We hope no injury happens to anybody else in general. We hope for good health for everybody. Um, Mm -hmm. If between now and then, uh, a big quarterback gets hurt. You can see Bryce Young being like, "Oh, actually, like that kind of worries me a little bit." Now I don't want to play. I'm not saying that will happen. I'm just did we did think he not, these guys did are not watch the Sugar Bowl last year? Yeah, exactly. Right. So it's one of those where it's like you just never really know if that's yeah. actually going to happen. You know, when they say no, that they're not going to play. You know, they're not going to play because they're not practicing. Right. So that's a different right. story. But when they say you're, you just never know. We do think they're going to play. That matters. Obviously, those are two fantastic players for Alabama. Matters yeah. a lot. It's part of the reason that they are. Uh, six and a half point favorites. Kansas State is fully healthy. With regards to the fan edge, I, I, I don't know. I mean, Alabama is not that far from New Orleans. So, I mean, I assume there's going to be a lot of Alabama fans. Kansas State fans, I mentioned this last year when they played LSU, they travel really well. I assume yeah. they're going to be down there in Groves. It's a big game for them. Um, big 12 champions here. They are excited for this. They finished, ten, they got 10 wins, um, coached very well. Um, this is a former coach from North Dakota State who obviously mm-hmm. did great things there. Um, I just cannot say enough good things about this Kansas State program. A little bit of chip on their shoulder, you have to imagine. Kansas State, yeah. given yeah. that Saban makes the comments about, well, TCU, how they lost to Kansas State, you know, all the, that other nonsense, right? And how, you know, implying that that was a bad loss, right? So all the motivational edge has to be here on Kansas State. You never really know with Alabama in these games when they don't make the playoff. They make the playoff so often. You just never yeah. know when they show up, obviously Saban is out there. He wants to win. Saban wants to win everything. I mean, I, I imagine yeah. playing checkers with Saban would be intense, right? Yes. Um, I don't think the guy wants to lose at anything, but what he does can only go so far with those players. So you just never really know about that, but I have no doubts about Kansas state motivation. We're going to grab the six and a half. Sunlight says it's a pretty well-priced line. Alabama is the fourth best team in the country, but Kansas state is the 10th best team in the country. The Wildcats are not a bad team and should not be slept on. I think they can hang around in this game. Don't know if they pull it off, but it should be a good game. Um, Kansas State does enough weird, different, unique things um, that I think they can hang around. And again, I know at least I've got the motivation factor. I know I've got the crowd being into it. I know I've got all those things that might not matter. And Alabama may have them too, but at least I don't have to worry about that with Kansas State. I know Kansas State really wants this game. And maybe Alabama does too, maybe not. I just don't want to question that if I'm laying a bunch of points. So we're going to grab a six and a half with the Wildcats. Because, Jared, what do you have to say? 
I don't have much else to add to that. This just feels like a game where, uh, you know, Kansas State has all the motivation in the world and in the grand scheme of things, what is this game for for Alabama? I mean, I know that Saban's going to be all about the process and doing things the right way, but I mean, at the end of the day, these are 18, 19, 20-year-old kids that, I mean, it's just it's just not the same, not having kind of that national championship at the end of the, the rainbow for them. So I think that Kansas State is going to come out and find a way to ugly this game up and just do just enough to keep it close and maybe they lose by a field goal. Maybe they'll lose by four points. Uh, but I just think that they have so much more motivation and I think they're going to be so much more into the game than the majority of these Alabama players are that I think six and a half points is just way, way too many for the situation. Yeah. Um, Alabama, of course, it's just an incredible run for them, right? Last year, yeah. uh, making the national championship game uh, two years ago, won the national championship year before that didn't make the playoff and they played, they did play really well beat up on Michigan. Now that Michigan team uh, was really one dimensional. Like all the Michigan yeah. teams have been up until recently where they yeah. finally actually got a quarterback and um, you know, a, a good running game, right. You know, a, a more all around team, but that Michigan team was very one dimensional. They, they won that really well. Um, a year before that made the national championship game a year before that won the national championship a year before that lost in the national championship game a year before that yeah. won the national championship. So, I mean, we don't have a lot of data on how they're going to do yeah. when they don't make yeah. the playoff. That one game, like I said, I, you can take something from it if you want. I don't really know. I will say the two uh, previous bowl games before that, they did lose um, one to Oklahoma, one to Ohio state. So, um, mm. you know, a very mixed bag of what to right. do with Alabama, not in a playoff game. Just don't really know. And that's my point is it's not, I'm not saying that they will show up or won't show up, but I don't want to anger the Alabama fans. They may show up. And if they show up and play really hard, they're a really good football team. But yeah. you've seen this Alabama team. There's a reason they've got two losses next to their name and they look questionable all season. You know, they, they questionable against an Ole Miss, right? A game at yeah. Ole Miss that they probably should have lost. Ole Miss is, I keep saying it's a better team than Ole Miss. Right, and it's that they they've got some flaws on their team, and if they don't show up, if there is any lack of motivation, any lack of man, we played the playoff and the national championship the last two years, that sort of thing, any of that, at least we know with Kansas State, at least we know what we're getting. Right, right. we just right. don't really know with Alabama, and even if we do, if they play, if Alabama plays the way they played against Texas, the way they played against Texas A and M, the way they yep. played against Ole Miss, all yep. three of those were wins that they didn't cover. Yep. And then, of course, you got the two losses to add to that. So uh, yep. a lot of ways that Kansas State can cover such a big number like six and a half. Completely agree. All righty. Well, that's the bowl games through the end of the year. Again, the semifinal games are in a standalone show. Check that out if you have not yet. Again, those numbers are mostly still available that we played on that show. Otherwise, Cousin Jared, any parting words? Can't believe it's it's getting to the end here. But like I said, one more episode to, to cover the last few bowl games, the national championship game. Uh, again, can't believe it's here, but we do have one sh college football show left. I guess then we can just have all the tears on that one, right? Yes, we can. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks for tuning into this episode of Fix with the Professor. Don't forget to subscribe so you can enjoy all the sports betting content we run on this channel. It's dropped right into your feed. We'll be back again six days a week now with college basketball betting content. Again, one more bull show. But until we see you again, as always, best of luck. And remember, you can eat your betting money, but please don't bet your any money.